angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Special investigative report. Twenty sixteen is a significant year. There have been prophecies about this year, the time in which we live, going back thousands of years. Welcome to a special investigative report on Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me in studio, two best-selling authors who've been conducting a multi-year, multi-part investigation on the days in which we live, and their new book just about ready to be released, will be the subject of, uh, well, much of what you'll see on Skywatch TV over the, over the next month or so. The book, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Last, The Vatican's Last Crusade. We welcome to Skywatch TV, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. Gentlemen, quite an adventure you have led people on through Petrus Romanus, Exo Vaticana, Path of the Immortals, and now The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, The Vatican's Last Crusade. For people who are relatively new to Skywatch TV, Let's go back to the beginning and kind of lead people through this journey that you guys have been on. Um, how did this all come together? Chris, you want to start with this one? How did this, these, these projects actually begin? Well, Derek, it's great to be back on Skywatch with you. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a strange story. Um, you know, I was finishing up my master's degree in theological studies. And I, uh, Tom had actually published one of my research papers. It was a critique of Christian transhumanism. Mm -hmm. And that was in the book, Pandemonium's Engine. But that's about all the contact we had ever had and just kind of an email relationship and really didn't, hadn't really met each other or anything yet. And, you know, I was uh, looking at the, the prophecy of the popes and was really curious why no one was saying anything about it because the next Pope on the list would be the final Pope, mm -hmm. according to that prophecy, a you know, 900 year old Catholic prophecy that a lot of Catholics take seriously and a lot of Popes have taken seriously, which makes it even more intriguing. You know, if they believed it, they're supposed to be the infallible <laughs> spokespersons for the church, right. right? Vicar of Christ. Yeah. So you have, you know, Popes believing in it yet at the same time, some of the Jesuits were debating whether it was authentic. And so it was an interesting subject and, you know, a lot of us feel like the end times are, are upon us just by the, the general um, attitudes and everything that we see in the culture and just the way things are going. And then you have this prophecy saying the final Pope is coming up next and no one was really talking about it. And so I sent Tom an email. What do you think about this prophecy of Pope? Cause he had quoted it in his book. And, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, maybe this is my chance to, to, to do some writing. So, you know, I, I suggested that and then Tom kind of picked up on it and th the rest is history. Well, <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of intrigue around it because uh, we had only ever had had a few email exchanges. We included an article by him in one of the books that we published, which was an anthology. And then we probably hadn't, we'd never talked on the phone, we'd never met each other. We probably hadn't even exchanged emails for at least a year or more. And yet on the same day across the nation, him in North Carolina and me in Idaho actually getting ready to do the Strategic Perspectives Conference got into this long discussion about why nobody had published, you know, a, a real investigative work on this allegedly 900 year old prophecy that was sacred to the Catholics, right? Knowing that whoever replaced Benedict would be the final one on this list. And, and that final one sounded very much like he's either the Antichrist or the false prophet, right? So we, I was uh, shocked by that. So I'm downstairs at, at um, uh, Strategic Perspectives. Joe and I are talking about it. I made some notes. And I said to Joe, I'm going to go up to my room, my hotel room. I'm going to email this to myself so that when I get home, I'm going to consider maybe writing a book on this. So I go up, I open my email up, and here's an email from Chris Putnam uh, saying, hey, uh, I would like to talk to you about the prophecy of the Pope. So I emailed him back and said, Chris, you cannot believe the timing, right? But that was only the first of really a whole series of supernatural, almost spooky kind of events, preternatural events unfolding one after the other. Uh, by the way, Chris is sitting here today and we would want the public to know 
that Chris is going to be joining the Skywatch Television news team. Uh, we, he will be producing original television. He'll be on the set from time to time. He's also going to help us with additional writing. Uh, but Chris had a dream years ago before we ever even started talking about building Skywatch Television in which, well, you tell him what you saw. It's, it's, it's really kind of unusual, Tom. Uh, it was around 2011, 2012, right when we started this project, I had a dream that basically I was on TV, like a news anchor, is kind of the way that the dream was. And um, for some reason, it was like a huge explosion or an earthquake in the Middle East, and we, all my coworkers, and I didn't know who these people were in the dream, it was just kind of vague, but everyone was cheering, and we believed that Jesus was coming back. The end times had started. Something, you know, clued us in. We thought the sixth seal had broken, something to, of that nature. And uh, we were all celebrating. And it, it was really odd. I was on television and I was working for you. Yeah. So and, he, he not only saw himself sitting here doing television, but he knew it was a TV uh, network that was owned by Thomas Horn. And, and, uh, and this before we ever even started talking about this. So that's, that's just a couple of things. The new book, by the way, has the biggest predictions we've ever made in it. And uh, so over the series of weeks as we're talking about this new investigative report, we'll get to some of those two yeah. that are additionally very interesting and very supernatural. Well, and, and because the two of you actually predicted the resignation of Pope Benedict uh, before a year in advance, mm -hmm. uh, and this was something that hadn't happened in hundreds of years mm -hmm. uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. Typically, uh, a pope serves until he, he dies. Right. Um, what was it about the prophecy of the popes? And this is, goes back to uh, St. Malachi, the, mm -hmm. uh, an Irish monk. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that you saw in the uh, prophecy of the popes that led you to conclude that Benedict was not, that, that he had a certain uh, end date, an expiration date on his, uh, uh, on his papacy? It wasn't specifically the prophecy of the popes that clued me into that. It mm. was the work of a Jesuit who was an ardent believer in that prophecy, and his name was René Thibault. And he wrote okay. a book, The Mysterious Prophecy of the Popes. Now, it was written in French, but I, I translated it and read it. He firmly believed that the final pope would arrive in the year 2012. Mm. Now, the thing that makes that more intriguing is that book is copyrighted 1951. All right, nobody was talking about 2012. You know, there was no Mayan prophecy that anyone right. was mentioning, none of that. So that was really odd that that lined up with this year that everyone was talking about so apocalyptically, you know. And uh, so Rene Thiebaud says the, the final pope's arrived in 2012, so Benedict has to be out of the way, right? And based on that, and some rumors about right. his health conditions and things like that. We went ahead and went on a limb, basically giving our book a one month shelf life. <laughs> <Yep>. um, <laughs> if we were wrong, right? Yeah. And um, it, it looked like that was the case at first. And then, you well, know. It was, it was actually kind of funny because, uh, you know, we went on, not, you know, on uh, uh, Sid Roth's uh, it's Supernatural, went on Jim Baker's program. So we're out there on some of the largest Christian television programs in the world. And we're saying that based on these calculations that Chris had uncovered that this Je Belgian Jesuit 63, now 64 years ago, ha thought that, you know, who would be Gloria Olive, so Pope Benedict, mm -hmm. would step out of the way in 2012. Well, that was one thing, and there was some other calculations that we did. Uh, so in our book, Petrus Romanus, we actually said, we believe that Benedict will step down in April of 2012. And, you know, people were saying that's never going to happen. Well, the book was only in print for a month or so, even though we were on television talking about it earlier than that. Uh, and April came and went and Benedict didn't step down. And so I kept sending Chris these different emails and I'd say something like, well, it's not over till it's over. And as soon as I'd hit send, I'd say, what in the world are you talking about? It's not over till it's over. You know, it's, we're, we're at the end of 2012, Benedict is still there. But then, yes. of course, February 28th, 2013, the Vatican announces that Benedict has resigned, but then they give an interview with the El Observatorio Romano, their official newspaper, gave an interview with the New York Times in which they admitted that Pope Benedict had actually officially resigned at the end of a trip when he returned at the end of March mm -hmm. to the Vatican and the beginning of April, he resigned to the Curia in secrecy. And in fact, they wouldn't even let the other cardinals know about it. It was just a handful of people that they believe could keep secrets. 
folks because remember at that mm -hmm. time they were in the middle of the whole Vatty Leaks thing and mm -hmm. they were trying to put a lid on secrets right. at the Vatican. Um, but we found out that we were exactly right. Tebow was right, Putnam was right, I was right. Uh, and people can go to Google, I mean to YouTube, and they can see programs in, you know, 2012, early in the year, and even late 2011, in which we're talking about our prediction that not only could we, but be we believed he was going to. Well, then, of course, the phone started ringing off the hook. We had people in Rome, even, that wanted to know, who is your insider at the Vatican? Because there was <laughs> no way you could predict this, uh, with the whole world telling you that's never going to happen, and then, of course, it did. Hmm. Well, we'll continue this discussion here and, and get into some of the connections between the Vatican and some of the fascinating work that you uncovered as your investigation continued into the, uh, uh, the extraterrestrial connection and the mm -hmm. Vatican's seeming fascination with something that they think is coming, mm -hmm. perhaps from out there. But we want to talk about the biggest giveaway of 2016. Uh, Tom, uh, as publisher of um, Defender Publishing, CEO of Defender Publishing, uh, you've kind of developed a reputation when you put out a major book like The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, The Vatican's Last Crusade, of giving people a lot more for their money than they can get anywhere else. Else. Um, you've got a few different uh, products here. I want to talk about these because you selected these directly. I mean, first one, of course, is uh, Chris, your presentation on the, uh, the Vatican's astrobiology connection, uh, astrobiology and the Vatican ET connection, uh, a video presentation. But these books, Tom, uh, Satan, You Can't Have My Promises, Satan's Dirty Little Secret, uh, What Happens When I Die, and Becoming a Prayer Warrior. Uh, you selected these books as, and of course, these will go to people uh, while supplies last once the book goes on sale. Uh, why did you select these titles in particular? Yeah, uh, well, those in particular because, and that's, you know, that'll cover, we bought a lot of pallets. That'll cover the first few thousand or whatever uh, orders that come in. And then if we do run out, they'll replace those with books of equal value. But I picked those in particular because when people read this final entry, and we never did plan, we didn't even plan two books, let alone four. It's just where the investigation took us. We had to go there. Uh, they'll understand why we believe the church needs to learn how to pray. And so these books very specifically teach you how to overcome evil, how to pray effectively. In fact, one of those books is considered one of the best books ever written on the subject of spiritual warfare. Hmm. And so I picked those on purpose. Now, in addition to those books, uh, we are also going to be giving away two mystery books. We always do this, right? And these are the books that are in our pallets. They're in our overstock. We still got, for instance, some of the King James Version Bibles. The, this, this is a 15 uh, uh, disc set. This originally sold for fifty dollars mm -hmm. retail by itself. We still have some of those. We still have "Survive the Unthinkable," which is a woman self protection book. Some of the books like uh, "The Labyrinth" by Mark Flynn. Classic. We're going to hope to have Mark Flynn on our program before long. We actually have some David Flynn collection books that are now in overstock. The George Pember collection, other books. So. The mystery books, they won't know what they're going to get, but there's probably a $40 value or something there. All together, uh, it'll be over $150. It'll be the biggest giveaway of 2016 for a limited time. Mm, we'll tell you more about that in just a second here. The Final Roman Emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's Last Crusade. Our conversation continues with Tom Horn and Chris Putnam next. In 2012, they shocked the international community when they predicted the resignation of Pope Benedict one year in advance. Breaking news, Pope Benedict XVI announces his resignation. Yeah, it is the first time in centuries a pope has stepped down. And I knew Pope Benedict was going to step down April 2012. Leaving the world wondering just who their insider at the Vatican really was. In 2013, they exposed the mysteries of Mount Graham, the Lucifer device. This first station is an instrument called Lucifer. And the Vatican's secret plan for the arrival of an alien savior. Then in 2015, they took the world underground to uncover the truth behind the Native American legends of giants, the portals they once came through and the most overlooked aspect of end times prophecy regarding their return. 
Ya Ashni Neya. Now, in their final entry to the explosive four-year investigation, internationally acclaimed best-selling authors Thomas Horn and Chris Putnam unveil their greatest discovery and make their most astonishing prediction yet involving the imminent prophesied arrival of a mysterious final Roman emperor. At that time, the prince of injustice, who will be called the Antichrist, will rise. He will be the son of perdition and the culmination of pride. He will deceive many, but when the Roman Empire will fall, then the Antichrist will show himself, and he will sit in the house of God in Jerusalem. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Thomas Horn, Chris Putnam. This will be the final entry and the greatest prediction yet, coming May 2016. The final Roman Emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's last crusade. Coming exclusively from Skywatch TV for a very limited time starting May 31st, 2016. When you purchase the new book and final report from Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade, you'll receive the largest giveaway of 2016, an unprecedented value of over $200 in free books, DVDs, audio files, and a data DVD library with tens of thousands of pages of ancient ancient literature no longer available, as well as movies, WikiLeaks files the government does not want you to see, and more for your library or to give away as gifts. Included in this biggest giveaway of 2016 are Chris Putnam's full-length DVD presentation, Astrobiology and the Vatican ET Connection, the new five-part Skywatch TV special investigative report on the book, The Final Roman Emperor, plus two mystery books with a $40 value, and a data DVD library with thousands of pages of ancient literature, movies, and audio series for your library or to give away as gifts. And for the first several thousand customers, while supplies last, you'll also receive Satan's Dirty Little Secret, the two demon spirits that all demons get their strength from. Satan, You Can't Have My Promises, the spiritual warfare guide to reclaim what's yours. What happens when I die? True stories of the afterlife and what they tell us about eternity. Becoming a prayer warrior, a guide to effective and powerful prayer. An unprecedented value of over $200 in never before offered free products. And the biggest giveaway of 2016, yours absolutely free when you purchase The Final Roman Emperor from SkywatchTV.com for only $19.95 plus shipping, beginning May 31st. But be advised, this astonishing promotion is limited to first come, first serve while supplies last. So it's urgent, beginning May 31st, 2016. You place your order for the final book and biggest prediction yet in this four-year investigation by internationally acclaimed best-selling authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade for only $19.95 plus shipping. This offer is on a limited time basis and will end without notification. So be sure to visit skywatchtv.com to follow the updates in the countdown to the biggest giveaway of 2016. Order the new book by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam on May 31st to receive the unprecedented value of over $200 while supplies last. Free products limited to quantity on hand and may be replaced by products of equal value. Skywatch TV's special investigative report continues. The final Roman Emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's last crusade. Chris Putnam and Tom Horn joining us. Uh, Chris, uh, the uh, investigation that you began uh, with the prophecy of the popes led you somehow into the Vatican's connection with extraterrestrials 
or, or, or the possibility of the existence of extraterrestrials. How did that, the, the one, lead to the other? Well, that's another interesting story. You know, I've always been interested in the, the topic of UFOs and, and those things. And, you know, even before I was a Christian, you know, I was interested in as I had collected newspaper articles, even when I was like 10 years old on that subject. But if you look at what the uh, Jesuit astronomers are saying in public, it's rather astounding. Um, you, know, you could look right in the, on the internet, there's plenty of articles about baptizing extraterrestrials into the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I and mean, what an unusual idea that is. Um, when most people are still discussing whether they exist or not, they're talking about baptizing them. Uh, do they know something we don't? <laughs> are they expecting thinking, something? Yeah. Right. And it makes you wonder, what business does the Roman Catholic Church have doing astronomy anyway? <laughs> I mean, why do they have an observatory? It would seem to fall <laughs> outside the uh, the Great Commission of it, uh, uh, it, yeah, making disciples of all nations. Yeah. Well, I think it's making disciples of all worlds is ah. what it's become now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so um, because around the same time that our book Petrus Romanus came out and we were doing all these TV and radio programs, uh, around that same time, some of the Vatican's top astronomers, Jose Gabriel Funes, who at that time was the head of the Vatican Observatory Research Group, what he calls the Vorg, yeah, <laughs> and he had fun with that, the yeah. Vorg, comparing them to the Borg mm -hmm. uh, in our book. But uh, he was out there, also Brother Guy Consul Magno, who, by the way, now is the new leader of the Observatory Research Group. They were out there saying, we'll baptize aliens. But then they started saying something even more curious. They, they, they were saying... Uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong uh, in believing in extraterrestrial life, that that is not a conflict with the Catholic faith. But then they took it a, a different step and they started saying, not only is it not wrong, they said the real heresy is in not believing mm. in extraterrestrial life because it puts limits on God's creative ability. Uh. Then they started saying things, this goes kind of back to what you just said, do they think they know something we don't know? They started saying it's more likely than not that there are extra, intelligent extraterrestrial life, not just organisms on another planet. And, and they just kind of just kept ratcheting it up until finally some of their top, we're talking Opus Dei level theologians for the church, saying that furthermore, not only are they likely to exist, but they could be morally superior to us because what we know about us is that we are fallen. Right. But mm -hmm. if they're unfallen, then they're closer to the Creator than we are mm. and would have a clearer revelation about God, about the, tri uh, the Trinity, and about the Gospel. And now they're literally writing papers that are going through the review view process that suggests that they may come here and it won't be us baptizing them, it's going to be them baptizing us into a corrected version of the gospel. Again, we're talking about the Pope's top theologians who are writing this stuff. A corrected version of the a gospel? A corrected version that's going to require us, they say, to rethink everything we've ever thought we knew mm -hmm. about the gospel. And, and they expect it. So anyway, so we're out there and, and now people are calling and they're saying, what do you guys make? Because you're talking about the Vatican, you're talking about the Pope. What do you guys make of what the Vatican is saying about extraterrestrials? And what we knew was if we were going to have a clear and authoritative answer, the only one way we were going to be able to do that, we had to get to the top mm -hmm. of Mount Graham in Arizona. Because that, you know, ever since Malachi Martin was interviewed on late night talk radio on Coast to Coast AM by Art Bell back in the 90s, uh, and Art Bell said to him, uh, why did the Vatican force themselves onto a mountain in southeastern Arizona. Over and, the objection of the locals. Well, uh, over the objection of environmentalists, yes. the native people. Uh -huh. So they literally did force themselves through federal court. Yeah. In fact, it was granted by fiat, and, and Chris did a great deal of research mm -hmm. into that. Uh, we knew we had to get up there because that's where Malachi Martin said, why are they on that mountain? He said, because at the highest levels of Vatican governance and, and jurisprudence, he said, they know what is approaching the earth and that it will be of the utmost importance in coming years. Now, there were other Catholics that say he's just making this stuff up, but keep in mind Malachi was the one who was conveying a whole lot of stuff that later on turned out to be absolutely true, the pedophilism that was going on, yes. the Luciferianism stuff that was conveyed to be true by him at the time that sounded outlandish. Mm -hmm. So uh, the longer Malachi Martin is dead, the more the credibility goes up. So if, it, if that's also true about uh, Mount Graham, then the, the church is watching something that is approaching the earth. So we, 
you know, we're probably going to have to talk about that in the next program. But we went out of yeah. our way and we were able to get up onto Mount Graham to meet with the Jesuit who was on duty and, and actually to see everything up there. So they're actually looking, though, at the possibility that and making the claim that perhaps what we've known the gospel to be for 2000 years is incomplete, not absolutely correct. It, in the paper that Tom's talking about, they said, that, you know, the, we're going to have to do a rereading of our scriptures based on this new information from the extraterrestrials. Um, and and it, it specifically says that. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that they're actively discussing. And that is know, astonishing. And the Vatican's having astrobiology conferences, you know, in Rome. They had one in America last year, um, you know, with the top secular astrobiologists. So astro astrobiology, what is that? You know, astronomy married with biology, life in space, the study of life in space. Now, we don't really know of any life in space, so yeah. I, I find it kind of amusing that you can get a PhD in something that you have nothing to study. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a scientific discipline in search right. of something to study. Right. Yeah. Um, well, there's more to it clearly than just science, though, because obviously we're dealing with a supernatural, a, a spiritual aspect here. I mean, supernatural... Well, you know, as we've said before, by, as Christians by default, we believe in the supernatural realm. Uh, and, and there's got to be more to it than this. Now, we've only got about a minute left, so mm -hmm. we'll have to continue this in our next discussion. But is there more to the emphasis on Mount Graham? In other words, why that specific location than uh, just a really good place to see the stars? Is there more to it than that? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that more in our, our, our next program because uh, there's not really time to develop that here, but we at least wanted to leave you with that little bit of tease. There's more to it. What is it about Mount Graham and perhaps other high places, and I use that phrase deliberately, around planet Earth? Our special investigative report on the final Roman emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's last crusade continues. And uh, again, Tom, in just about a minute's time, uh, just touch again on when... Folks, order this book. Uh, first, when will it be available and how much product are you including with the book? Yeah, uh, it's going to be available the third week of May. So right at the time when these programs are broadcasting, uh, that'll be the time when the book will be released. And if they watch the commercial, it's got the date on it for the actual release date. Uh, and uh, couldn't be more excited about it. But this this book really is the tour de force. That's the other part of this whole series. Petrus Romanus started out strong. Ex of Vaticana was even stronger. Path of the Immortals took us places we never expected to go. But wait until people read this book because it is a bombshell. Well, it is timely because uh, the headlines uh, and, and the image on the, the graphic on the cover showing the, uh, the Islamic State's flag flying from uh, the obelisk in St. Peter's Square hints at the uh, subject material of the book. And we will cover that as our special investigative report into the final Roman emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's last crusade continues. For Tom Horn, Chris Putnam, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology. Conspiracy. Discovery. Special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV.
Hi folks, this is Tom Horn, and as promised, I'm back again to give you an update on the sevenfold vision. Uh, first of all, though, let me introduce uh, part of the team from the Whispering Ponies Ranch, the administrative leadership that's with me in the studio here today. Joe Artis. Hey, Tom. Thanks for Nita having me. Anita Horn, the beautiful one. And James Howell, who you haven't had an opportunity to meet before. James, great to have you with us here today. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, James is a, he's a board member for our nonprofit and actually the VP of the organization, so we have to treat him well, otherwise we could get ourselves into trouble. Well, last time, uh, Derek and Sharon Gilbert uh, interviewed me on the sevenfold vision for Skywatch Television. And you learned, of course, at that time that there's a whole lot more going on here than making television. It involves what we call the Whispering Ponies Ranch, which is a retreat facility that we're going to be talking about uh, more here in a moment, and a lot of other issues that we are involved with. And at that time, what's interesting is that almost everything that we were talking about was still just a future vision. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. Well, I'm back to give you the good news that first of all, as you can see, we said we were going to build a new studio and boy, have we. Uh, <laughs> it, it really feels like we're sitting right in the middle of Fox News here, doesn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> and uh, uh, poor uh, Joe has spent the last few weeks here trying to get all of this lighting uh, correct, but we think we're pretty close to having it. Very close. Uh, we've got a whole lineup of people coming in that'll be sitting in this brand new studio uh, with me here in the weeks to come. I'll tell you some of those names in a moment. Some of the other things that we talked about that day was we had said that Derek and Sharon were settling into their new digs and that soon they'd be making daily television. Well, as you probably already know, uh, you can go to skywatchtv.com Monday through Friday and get the news uh, analyzed from a Christian worldview from our news desk anchor, Derek Gilbert. I want to thank all you people that have been emailing in and talking about uh, Derek and the news updates and how much you appreciate them. Uh, last time around, we also had said that we were going to have a Roku channel. Well, if you don't know it, go there, sign up for our Roku channel. It's been online now for about 30 days. And as I understand it, we are already getting over 100,000 video plays a week right now. Mm -hmm. And the Roku channel is just taking off like crazy. It's very Another exciting. thing we mentioned yep. that day, Skywatch Magazine. It was just an idea, right? We're now in our fourth month of publication. The magazine is still only online, but very soon it's going to go to print and we're going to start mailing copies to all of the people that are our subscribers and our viewers. We also mentioned that day our conference. Well, since then, we've signed a contract with a hotel, with a conference facility, and you're going to be hearing some really big news about the upcoming 2016 conference. It is going to be the one to be at. Everybody who's <laughs> anybody that's in the news today has already signed up to be part of that. And then finally that day, we also mentioned an upcoming television program that is going to be dedicated to <clears throat> women only. Right. Sharon Gilbert's going to be the host, uh, two or three of the other women from, uh, from, yeah, Whispering Ponies Ranch and Skywatch TV will be part of that, and it'll be news and issues and events that are seen through the prism of a woman's point of view. Now, why do I have this elite group of people with me today <laughs> from the Whispering Ponies Ranch? Well, we've also got big news about Whispering Ponies Ranch. And first of all, though, let me, let me start out by asking uh, a question. Any one of you can take this question. Um, I understand that yesterday you went to an event mm -hmm. and it took place inside of a care facility, right? Right, yep. Uh, who wants to tell me what, what, what was that about? Why did you go? What does it have to do with the Whispering Ponies Ranch? Well, as you stated before in the original sevenfold vision, you know, we showed some B-roll of animals and their involvement with the therapeutic side of some of the care that these individuals receive. And you find that a lot of the folks that are in like care facilities or assisted living situations, um, they don't get as much visitation as, as I think a lot of the population assumes they do. And you learn really quickly that a lot of these individuals might not 
if it weren't for visitors, people external from the family coming in to visit or do something like this, they, they receive no fellowship at all outside of the staff. And uh, as you talked about in the original Sevenfold Vision show, that animals and their handlers have this wonderful opportunity to go into these places and do something special and receive something special that's quite magnificent. And, and when you look at what can be done with the use of animals, a lot of times um, individuals struggle to communicate or individuals that for whatever reason are shut down socially. When you introduce an animal, this is not a person who's going to use them for something. Mm -hmm. This is not a person with an agenda. They're not mm -hmm. there to take advantage of in any way or abuse these people. You enter a room with an animal and suddenly there's like this magical interest immediately. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, there's the horse. Oh, I can't believe it. You know, and, and it's, it's exciting and it, and it really takes the, commu the, the, the barriers of communication and kind of brings them down and now you're just having this wonderful interaction. Um, and a lot of the feedback that we get from the staff at these particular venues is that this might be the only visitation that these people receive, mm -hmm. period, um, apart from very limited visits, perhaps from family, but also that the nature of it, because we're introducing animals, that's also kind of an exceptional, spectacular kind of an event. Um, and it can be some of the best times that these, that these folks are having, you know, inside of a inside of a given month so right I mean so and and you know as studies have continued forward over the years and especially as Americans and most of the world have become a lot more open to using animals in particular for therapeutic purposes I mean the military is finding that people that are suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome they get these these uh, therapy animals or they get these uh, what do they call them their pet it's the pets that they keep for themselves companion companion animals, companion yeah. animals. Uh, how that that has just all, all, I hate to use the term mystical because the new age has kind of ruined that but it's, right the, but there's something about it that goes beyond what uh, humans can do because we've lost that trust factor when when we worked for years at a place called Camp Davidson uh, some of the things that we learned there is what we intend to do at the Whispering Ponies Ranch involved the uses of animals to help there in, in particular specialized camps that were called Royal Family Kids Camps. Mm -hmm. And these are kids that for whatever reason have become wards of the state. Either their parents have died or in fact more often I think they were abused. These are children that may have been physically abused or mentally abused, and they wind up belonging to the state. And these are kids that have really closed down. And we right. would watch them come into Camp Davidson. I mean, the first day they're there, they're, they look like hardened criminals, very young little children. And you realize that they're at a point in their life where they could go either direction, right? Right. right. They could become the next Jeffrey Dahmer, or they might become the next Billy Graham. But their life was really at a point, and you would watch during the week how every day their countenance would be changing. And very right. slowly, these kids that had no trust in humans at all right. because they'd been abused <clears throat> through using small ponies or puppies or whatever it was they were using, those barriers started coming down. And now you could bring them back to a point of healing and they could learn trust again. But, the, but that animal was that, that key member. They were a part of your staff. They were a valuable part of your staff. And so... We intend to do the same thing at Whispering Ponies Ranch, and actually it happens two ways. One, before uh, the end of this fall, we will be running our first day camps at the Whispering Ponies Ranch. So that's part of our big update here is that we will be at a point where we will be running our first events at the Whispering Ponies Ranch. That's where groups of Royal Family Kids Camps or other people, it could be adults, that are going to come to the facility and in different kinds of ways, the land, the prayer trails, they can fish there, they can hike there, they can go on walks on the prayer trails. Mm -hmm. But for some of these kids, we're also going to be using these therapy animals. Now, in some instances, the animals that you're certifying for therapy, you actually are taking them to remote locations, which is kind of what you did yesterday. And right. Nita, I want to ask you a question, uh, because at this event yesterday, there was a horse there that actually belongs to the Whispering Ponies Ranch. Tell me who that horse is and why was it there? Well, we had this wonderful opportunity to take our little 28-inch uh, Palomino miniature horse named Blondie down um, to visit with our friend Jenny Keist, and she had her little horse, Go Baby. And so we took both these little horses and Seely, 
um, what you're fixing to meet and to this facility to to do a visitation. It was Blondie's first time. So we were a little bit apprehensive how she's going to react because she has never seen wheelchairs. This is part of their training. She handled all of the people grabbing at her ears. They want to muzzle up underneath the nose is one of the things that they, just all in her face, mm -hmm. all day long for two and a half hours. And she did awesome. And, and James was there to help. He kind of managed the head end and I kind of walked behind to make sure she didn't get you know, nervous or anything, but I didn't even need to be there. She was just awesome. So her, she's been down there, uh, Jenny, that you mentioned. Jenny Keist. Keist. Um, and that's what she does. She, yes. tr she specifically trains uh, miniature yes. horses for yes. therapy uses. Yes. And yes. she's been written up. She's been in the media. She's, she's been very, on the news. She's, she's a very, very high-level trainer. She's been a good friend of yours now yes. for some years, which ironically actually yep. goes back to you buying a horse from her and then giving it back to her later right. on. Right. But, uh, yeah, very sweet woman and specialized trainer. Right. And uh, so, but this is one of, we have many horses that are going to be involved right. in the program. She's one of them. Right. And she's been in training. You know, some people are probably saying, what, a 28-inch horse? I mean, this is a tiny <laughs> little animal, and yet she's actually big compared yeah. to some. You've, you've got the world's second smallest yeah. miniature horse, which is like 18 yeah. inches tall. Chigger. Uh, Chigger, and she's <laughs> involved in therapy. <laughs> therapy uses, yeah, Chigger. Um, I want to ask James a quick question. Um, about what motivates him to be involved, because I don't think you were involved in this type of ministry uh, up until now. Uh, you are uh, the VP of this institution. You're also a member, a board mm -hmm. member of our uh, charitable organization, nonprofit. Uh, and yet it you, seems like you've been taking on an increasing role. You're not on salary. You don't draw a salary. You're donating uh, large amounts of your time. Right. What was it about this that made you even want to be part of it? Well, I get fed pretty well, <laughs> um, so that's always a good plus. But uh, just I've learned a lot, and it's a, a matter of service for me mostly. We've uh, all been blessed in various ways, and I feel uh, in response to being blessed uh, that some kind of services, it, it feels right to me to extend that as a response to the blessings I've received. And it's been fun. So, yeah. And plus, you and I were talking about, uh, and this before we went on uh, the air, we were talking about um, the biblical principles that mm -hmm. are behind this, and the numerous places in Scripture where it talks about God and His relationship with creation and why he made them and how he uses them. And Jesus even saying that not even a sparrow falls to the ground, that God does not account for it. So there is a unique, special ministry. And when animals are brought back under dominion, right? Mm -hmm. That's what one of these books goes into that we're going to tell people uh, how they can get their own copy of it. When they're brought back into dominion, they become part of a covenant family. Even raises questions about whether they'll be in heaven, things like that. Right. Um, but specifically, the Whispering Ponies Ranch. Now, let's mention some of the things that we're doing there right now. Uh, not only do we have animals that are in training, uh, and very close to a point where we can start actually using them for both on-campus and off-campus uh, ministry uses. Uh, the last time we talked to the audience about the sevenfold vision, uh, we had just gotten started with some of the construction. We would want people to know that the large um, training facility is already built. It's already finished. Right. Uh, tell me. Uh, what do you use that facility for? Why do you need such a great, big, huge horse arena when you're using these miniature horses? What are you going to use it for? Part of what we would love to do is build an obstacle course in there that gives us an opportunity to expose these animals to just about anything that you would need them to know before they go out into the, uh, to the field. You know, for instance, uh, things that you walk over, things you walk through, Mop buckets, I mean, everything to a little animal, to horses especially, can be very scary. Like transitions in the floor. Yes, the flooring itself can be very frightening. If you go from vinyl to carpet, they can stop, yes. you know, the co having to cope with a new kind of yes. floor. Bricks even, um, just 
anything that looks different or feels different to them can be a big challenge for them. Mailboxes. Everything. Well, you were, you were, yeah, mailboxes. You were telling me that, <laughs> yeah. b basically think of it this way, that a horse thinks everything in the world wants to eat it. Yeah, they pretty so much So when you do. open a mailbox, that's a giant that's mouth, a right? Mouth. Yeah. right? Or you're going to go in a tunnel, another mouth, right. it's yeah. a bigger one. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, right. And, but also things like all of a sudden, loud clapping right. sounds. Yes. Yeah. You might be yes. inside of a facility and it, you don't want yes. a horse to right. get spooked and right. bump into somebody. A yes. wheelchair, what is it? It's scary to yes. them. So part of your obstacle course is teaching them to walk over, walk in. Right. Right. These horses have to be able to walk inside of a building yes. and not go to the bathroom. Right. They might be in there for two hours. That's right. right. And they gotta, they gotta, right. they're, you're potty breaking horses, yes. right? Potty yes. They've gotta be able to go in an elevator. Yes. Now, I, you know, if a horse has a hard time walking over a piece of plastic right. on the ground. Imagine what it feels like to a horse to walk into an elevator and have the floor start moving right. and their, exactly. their sense of elevation. Right, not so, to mention the, the elevator doors opening up, yet another mouth. Yet another mouth. It's all scary. Right. It's, it's called strategical desensitization. And this is what we do with dogs and with miniature uh, ponies. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I saw James mm -hmm. Uh, in the arena, and he had what was it? A it was a plastic bottle, or it was a shopping bag at the end of a stick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when he whips it around, it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but but James knows how to introduce just a bit so that the horse isn't mm -hmm. overwhelmed, and then and then conceal right. the device or the apparatus or whatever it is that's setting the, the the horse into a stressful state of mind. And the, and then the horse begins to relax, and then he'll introduce it again. And then over time, what happens is that eventually you can just wave that sound or, or, or that item around, and the horse is not reactive to it at all. Right. And that's necessary because, like, when you go into a mixed uh, environment like we were in yesterday, you have, like, like Nita mentioned, wheelchairs. You have walkers. walkers you have, canes. Uh, and, and, you know, yesterday, for example, there was an outburst. Mm -hmm. It was a totally unforeseeable outburst, and it happened almost immediately when mm -hmm. we came in. We were there three minutes right and two of the the individuals residents. that live there the residents uh, began a, a you know a verbal scuffle over who was going to get to pet the horse first <laughs> right. okay right at, at first some of our team thought that they were kidding but no it was no. indeed it was a scuffle <laughs> to see who was going to get to the horse first I, yeah. my turn in line i want to pet yeah. well um you know the horse was totally not reactive so when nita yeah. says this was the first visit right. Um, just, just so that we're clear, this, this horse has been through this strategical desensitization sure. process for weeks and weeks and weeks building up. They don't even do their first visitation until they're, they've been field tested in right. local controllable environments. So that hopefully that, you know, like yesterday, that's, that, that's the reaction that you want is that there is no reaction. The right. horse stood there like, you know. And you know what, I, you know what, there's something that I love about this, folks, is, and Nita was explaining this to me the other day, uh, this metaphor from our relationship with God, right. that if you can get an animal, what, what eventually happens with the animal is they get to where nothing distracts them. Why? Because they have so learned to trust exactly. their handler. That's right. It's a that they, that they know that no matter where they're at, sounds, weird devices, whatever, but if I'm with the handler, That's I'm right. okay. Right. They're not going to put me in a situation that they can't control or in which I would be harmed, <clears throat> reflecting the same relationship really that we ought to have with God. Because life throws a lot of stuff at us, right? Unexpected events. You suddenly open a door, something's happening. But if you can come to the point where you can know mm -hmm. that I'm with God, I'm walking with God, and he's never out of control. Right. There's never anything that he can't control. So my trust is no longer in myself, right. my own finances, oh, my own Kung Fu. So what a cool metaphor that you, in taking dominion over animals, are extending that whole Genesis creation where God has dominion over man, but he gives man dominion over animals, and yet that whole relationship between right. trust. And so I, 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 in particular, really loved that. I thought, wow, this is like the follow-up book to Do Our Pets Go to Heaven. We're going we're gonna to have to uh, hurry because we're going to run out of time in, in a few minutes here. And there's a few more things I want to bring up that you not only have built this big training facility, it's in use now. We also are right now, uh, all of the plumbing and infrastructure is in place. The foundation has been laid for the public bathrooms. Uh, and uh, also this week, the men are coming in with the equipment where they're going to put in an RV park. 
Now the RV park could be used by people that are visiting, but it also can be used by volunteers, like right. MAPS volunteers, mm -hmm. that come and donate their time or right. part of their time during the year, and we provide complete hookups. So they've got water and sewer and power. Right. Now we also have, and I want to make the public aware of this because it's something that we're just praying about right now. All of the land right next to us has suddenly become available, a forest. It's 108 18, acres. 118. 118 acres. Um, it's somewhat expensive. Um, if you watched the first seven-fold vision update a couple of months ago with Derek and Sharon Gilbert, you know that Nita and I actually came to Missouri to retire, and we took all of our retirement income and we've put it back into the 150 acres that we have now to develop the Whispering Ponies Ranch and built these facilities. We've also built the lodge. We've built a, we've built a beautiful 4,500 square foot lodge that'll host about 50 people, up to 50 people. Right. Um, but now we're at a point where we don't have the money to buy this land that is adjacent to us, but we would love to so that we could extend what will become the Whispering Ponies ranch retreat facility where both adults and children will be able to come for restorative ministries. Um, and the, the lodge that we've built could of course also be used for like a women's retreat or a writer's conference. So it's really not going to be any limit on how it could be used. We're sharing with you what really our motivation is though and what's driving it is this therapy type ministry where children and adults can go through a healing process. That's really what is motivating us. And I want you to help us pray about this, uh, this land. Um, I would love to purchase it. I don't have the money to purchase it right now. Um, and we are at a point in our ministry where Defender Publishing is actually generating the revenue. When people buy books or DVDs or any of that product, it's the revenue coming in from Defender Publishing now that's paying salaries, personnel to run the Skywatch television. Uh, and there are people who also are making donations. We are a 501c3 um, tax deductible. Uh, donations can be made to us. And we appreciate those who have been doing that. Uh, but we want you to help pray with us about this land. Because if we should buy it, we would want to do that before somebody else perhaps buys it. And then maybe they develop it in ways that we don't want right next to the Whispering Ponies Ranch. So please pray with us about that. And if you can, um, make donations to help us move the Whispering Ponies Ranch forward. Before we run out of time, we are going to offer for $40. Now this is $85 worth of material. Uh, we're going to send you Mike Huckabee's book, Dear Chandler, Dear Scarlet, A Grandfather's Thoughts on Faith, Family, and the Things That Matter Most, which reflects, of course, you know, some of the issues that we deal with here at the Whispering Ponies Ranch. Also, a very important book actually, Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? This is a question that scholars have asked throughout the centuries, and we actually came into some pretty amazing information included in the Bible during the research for that book. We also have a training DVD. Now this is a best-selling training DVD, The Natural Dog Training Method. It's actually put together by Joe Artis. It's been one of the best sellers ever since it came out. How long is this DVD? Two hours. It's two hours, and it goes through all of the basic things. I'm reading the back of it. Uh, the correctional touch, the walk, feeding by invitation, properly giving treats and rewards. It goes through all everything you need to know on how to teach your dog to behave in a way. In fact, we're going to introduce him to a dog in a moment that's been through <laughs> some of this training, but who also is now part of the uh, uh, Whispering Ponies Ranch Ministries. And then finally, here's a, a gigantic book that we just put out, the George Hawkins Pember Collection. This has not been available until now. We it's actually, brand new. we Beautiful. scoured, yeah, it's never been for sale before. We scoured the universe. We found uh, all of the most important works by George Hawkins Pember, some of which are not available anywhere. They're not online, they're not in PDFs, you can't get them anywhere. We had to find old copies of those books and then we paid a lot of money to get them and then we had to retype them. They're in the public domain and we have put it together in one oversized collection 
Six complete classic works in one volume, the George Hawkins Pember Collection. This book alone uh, sells retails for $30, but we're going to send you all three of those books plus the Natural Dog Training uh, DVD for $40, over $85 value, and these will be in the store. You'll be able to find that online at skywatchtv.com. Uh, before we get out of here, Joe, I understand that we have a special guest we do. with us today. We do, a very special guest. Yeah. <laughs> Should we bring her in? Sure, let's do it. I'd like to introduce the Skywatch TV audience to Seely. Seely, come here, baby girl. Come here, girly. <laughs> She's never been on TV before. She's wondering what all the lights are about. Yeah. And I want to show the audience at home because this is just fun. Why they named her Seely? Oh, because <laughs> she looks like a little seal. She's a, yep. You pull the hair back. She's a little baby seal. But you've got so, her like a little baby lion or something there with that. Uh, yeah, this is the fox cut. <laughs> this is the fox cut. So, well, folks. I appreciate you watching Skywatch Television, uh, supporting everything that we are doing here. At the end of the day, our efforts are about ministering the healing that comes from Jesus Christ in a way that can come from no other. We also, of course, are taking the gospel around the world via television. Uh, we are about to go on to hundreds more television stations. We ask you to help us do that. Here's the, the main ways in which you can help. Number one, please do pray for this ministry. If you would, every day when you pray, remember to lift up Skywatch Television and Whispering Ponies Ranch. Uh, before the Lord. Ask the Lord to keep us on track and to be wise with the opportunities that He has given us. The other thing is purchasing books through our bookstore right now is the number one way that revenue is coming into this ministry. And so somebody else may have the book. Amazon may ha even have it for a few dollars uh, less than we do, and they have shipping rates that we can't touch. But just know that when you purchase something from the Skywatch TV store, uh, it is going into a ministry. It is helping us take the gospel around the world. You can make a tax deductible donation. Uh, right now, Whispering Ponies Ranch is the largest monetary needs we have because building large structures costs a lot of money. And we're doing it as we can. And we wanted to come back today and let you know that when we spoke to you two months ago, it wasn't a pipe dream. We've essentially done everything we've said we were going to do, and we are doing it right now. And we appreciate your prayer and your partnership. Uh, uh, James and Nita and Joe and Seely, thank you for being with me today on Skywatch Television. You're welcome. Thanks for having us.